Welcome to another episode of Show and Tell Books. I'm Amber. And I'm Chantal. And today we're talking about divine rights. Okay, I absolutely love Divine Rivals. I read it just after I read Fourth Wing because so many people on Book Talk were like, oh, if you liked Fourth Wing, read Divine Rivals. And it's nothing like Fourth Wing, but it is a good book. So Divine Rivals is the story of Iris and her desire to become a war correspondent. And it's set in a fantasy world that's kind of um, similar to World War II era vibes. That's what I thought of as I was reading this book. And the, the way the language is used, you're not getting a lot of fantasy world building in this story, in my opinion, because it is um, similar to the feel of a historical novel more than what you would think of a traditional fantasy. Iris is a journalist who had really high aspirations in school, was high achieving, but her brother left to join the war effort and her mother was going through some rough times and because of that she left school and decided that after losing contact with her brother she was going to become a war correspondent. Roman is her co-worker who they have been rivals in the newspaper office because they are both rookies trying to get a place as full-time journalists and he comes from a well-to-do family where she looks at his life and is like oh everything's perfect and there's some debate on if people are like oh no they weren't true rivals like this isn't a real rivals book and i i think it was i thought that there from her perspective and his there was a rivalry at play Iris goes on to become a war correspondent looking for her brother because he's missing in action. And in the course of doing that, she finds out that her typewriter is magical and sends letters through door jams. I don't want to give anything else away. No spoilers. <laughs> I completely agree with you. Part of the reason we read this book is because of book talk and how everyone was talking about it. And it was right after the hype of Fourth Wing. And everyone's like, okay, if you read Fourth Wing, you'll love this book. It's fantastic. And I liked it, but not on the same level as Fourth Wing, actually. I agree that it has more of a historical fiction feel to it than like a full fantasy novel, which I thought was really interesting because usually book talk's not super into historical fiction or this style of writing. This was very clean and very wholesome which is usually not book talks take. But still, I agree. I thought it was cute. The way I described it was if you take the letter writing romance of the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society with like your favorite historical fiction novel, usually set in World War II. And I actually said that the fantasy is pretty similar to if you've read Grave Mercy and that trilogy, it's very similar to that in how the gods are at play with mortals and things like that so that one that aspect of it was kind of cool because i love all of those books and movies and so having that in a very whimsy cute romance through writing and the power of words and the magic of telling a story it was a cute read for sure so i might have the unpopular opinion on this one i enjoyed divine rivals way more than i enjoyed fourth wing I gave both of them five stars. However, the five stars for Fourth Wing was purely based on vibes and like, oh, did I have fun reading this? hype and hype? Whereas I felt like Divine Rivals was a much better written novel with better plotting and character development. Interesting. I gave Divine Rivals four stars where I gave Fourth Wing five stars. I actually think I like the plot and the writing style better in Fourth Wing than Divine Rivals, though I did like Divine Rivals. I just felt like it didn't truly reach the potential it had. It left a little bit missing, which does make me excited for the second book, which comes out in a couple of months. Yeah, in December. So um, the second book will release right before Christmas. So it made me excited for that one because I think she has a lot of potential to make the book spectacular, whereas I felt like it was cute and fun and whimsy, but it wasn't like a, a holy crap, what did I just read? 
So I thought it was emotional in the in the storytelling. And I think this has more to say about me because I was reflecting on some of the books that I've really enjoyed reading this last week or month and there or even year. And there's a common thread and that's grief. I've decided now that in order for a book to get three stars on my scale, apparently it has to have grief in the storytelling. And I I don't think that should be an actual requirement, but that's the trend that I've noticed in my reading. And I think that holds true for Divine Rivals and Fourth Wing. They both deal with familial loss and the grief associated with that. And I think Divine Rivals dealt with that in a more upfront manner. And maybe that's why I connected it, connected with it more and thought there was more character development and plot development. I will agree with that, that the grief aspect of it added an extra layer that was not present in Fourth Wing, per se. That did kind of help bring both the characters together and also just weave a, like, fragility and hope throughout the novel. The nostalgia feel of some of the movies that it's very similar to were the books. I think lended itself to making it the book talk sensation that it is, even though if you look at it at its core, the writing style is still slightly underdeveloped, in my opinion. However, I actually have read other ones of her books that I didn't know. And so again, I think it's very interesting that this one took off as well as it did on book talk because she's not a necessarily popular author. Like, I don't even remember how I found her to begin with prior to Divine Rivals. And I will say that this Divine Rivals versus the books I'd read prior to by her have shown growth in writing style. So again, this is why I'm excited for book two. I thought it was interesting because I would put this in the new adult category. It straddles the young adult, new adult categories for me. And I would put it in the new adult, but it feels very much like a young adult book and writing style. I would say it's YA up until you get to like the 80% mark. And then it barely crosses over that line. Whereas the book talk counterpart of Fourth Wing, which we will talk about in a later video, is very much new adult. Well, because on like we're, we'll talk about Spice Scale on for both of those books, right? And the only reason we're making the comparison to Fourth Wing is because so much of the rhetoric on social media has already made that comparison. But Divine Rivals is not a spicy book at all. Like there's, it's closed door, fate to black. You're not getting spice in this. Whereas Fourth Wing is a spicier book. What would you even rank it on the spice scale? Because quite frankly, I'd put it at like a zero. Yeah, I feel like it was less than the cheat sheet. Like it's definitely less than Practice Makes Perfect. And so like clean Regency romance books, that's very much the same vibe and style as Divine Rivals. So which is I think like our zero. I hate the enemies to lovers trope anyways, because it's not real. Like it doesn't actually exist. Right. I've never read one where I'm like, yes, they were actual enemies. You would have to have a really compelling plot line to convince me that a full enemies to lovers is possible. Because that implies hatred. I think regardless, this felt like a story that could actually happen, which I thought was kind of cute and fun, especially because of the World War II historical fiction aspects to it, even though it's not World War II whatsoever. The like, we're going after the same job, the butting of heads and all of that, it felt real. Yeah. I will say in the, in the fantasy world building, there were a lot of fantasy readers who complained about the world building of this novel. And they're like, I don't know why the gods are at war. I felt like the author actually addressed that in the tidbits about the mythology that was revealed. So if you are familiar with Greek mythology or Roman mythology, I think picking up on that in the mythology characters and development she used as breadcrumbs throughout the story, I felt like there was enough of that world building that it didn't have an issue with this war taking place and existing. Like I, I kind of understood what was going on. I believe that's more of the topic for the second novel and why she didn't make it a huge focus in the first. And then the reason that we are using World War II as such a comparison for this is because it's trench warfare. And I felt like Rebecca Ross did a 
excellent job of describing trench warfare and the conditions that existed in that and that's why there's that strong feeling of world war one world war two references i will say as a fantasy reader i would not necessarily categorize this as fantasy it's an I, intro to fantasy but i do agree with a lot of people is if you go into it thinking it's going to be a fantasy novel and even you know fantasy novels part of i guess their core definition is the world building aspect of it and some authors do the data dump of a world building better than others, in my opinion. But this does not have that at all. I did like how she told the fantasy aspect of it throughout the novel of like letters or different myths that then explain what's actually happening. I think it could have flowed a little bit better and like been incorporated into the actual novel a tiny bit better, a little bit more like a fantasy novel than a historical fiction novel. It's almost as if Rebecca Ross was like, I'm going to write a World War II historical fiction novel that might not sell well because fantasy is what's taking over book talk. So I'm going to throw in the barest hint of a gods against humans war instead of World War II. If you've seen um, Wonder Woman and their take on World War II, that is probably where this kind of concept came from. Yeah, I think that's the the Wonder <laughs> Woman movie is a great touch point for like, what does this feel like? What's recent media that's similar to it? And I would say that's a great comparison. I really enjoyed it, honestly. I, I thought this character development between the two main characters was great. I also enjoyed the side characters and the role that they played in moving the story along. I agree that I wouldn't categorize this as a fantasy. To me, it's more, much more of a romance novel. Like if someone was to hold it up and say, a uh, 10 second reaction, how would you categorize this? And I'd be like, a young adult romance. And that's the closest way I would categorize it too. You know how on BookTok everyone's like, okay, here's a fantasy romance versus a romance fantasy. This one is definitely a romance fantasy. But I would also even go like, it's a historical romanticy. <laughs> thought it was a very emotional ending. Like, I think that there was a lot of emotions that Iris was experiencing in the last chapter, two chapters that I thought was compelling. One of my favorite things about this book that really actually made it the four stars instead of a three star is the romance between Roman and Iris. I thought they did that really, really well. And the sacrifices that both of them make the efforts especially that roman undergoes in order to win iris the trench scenes were extremely touching and extremely eye-opening combined with the like romance of the letters that are being exchanged it just that part was really cute i will say my biggest complaint about it is the miscommunication towards the end. I don't remember what percentage of the book we're talking about, but he needs to own up to something to her. And there's that level of miscommunication before he does. And I am so sick of that in story. So that was the, my complaint is like, can we, can we collectively move on from that? <laughs> It's tweet cute in a historical fiction novel. That's like kind of what it is. Um, the talking to someone through multiple methods of communication trope. I don't actually know what the title for that is. Is happening a lot, especially in YA novels. And it is kind of getting tired, for lack of a better word. This one I thought did it in a different way. So I did appreciate that. But the like falling for two separate guys even though they end up being the same person. I think we are about ready to retire that and move on to a different kind of miscommunication trope, mainly because it always leads to like feelings of being played, which is kind of what happened here and his inability to actually fess up to that and do it in a way that didn't hurt Iris, which I don't know of a single novel that has this kind of plot and doesn't end up hurting one of the characters there's yeah. like that's an essential characteristic i think it's one of the last novels i've read where i stayed up super late to finish it so i'd have to go back and look at like my reading journal 
but I think I read it in one day and I think I stayed up super late to finish it because I enjoyed reading That's it. Compelling. So as always, let us know in the comments what you think. I'm interested to see what side of some of these conversations you fall on and let us know what you're reading right now because we're always looking for good book recommendations. Don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, check out another video. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.